Ail Weissman is founding director of forensic architecture and professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. This evening, his lecture entitled Investigative in Aesthetics, uh, Ayal will discuss the fun fundamental notion of architecture as political intervention. Looking at forensic architecture's development, both as a research agency and a field of practice, he will explore its approach to collaboration, development of new open source investigative techniques and expansion into new areas of inquiry in response to an evolving digital landscape. Thank you so much, Eyal, for joining us this evening. Uh, we really look forward to what you have to share with us, and I'd like to welcome you to the digital stage. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for so much for tolerating another Zoom lecture. It would obviously be much more fun being in Barcelona with you again uh, and speaking together. Um, I guess today I, uh, uh, under the title uh, Investigative Aesthetics, <clears throat> which is also a title of a recent book, I have uh, co-authored with a person called Matthew Fuller, a colleague of mine at Goldsmiths. Um, we're trying to think about different notions of aesthetics, different from the way that we traditionally understand aesthetics as you know, an act of beautification, um, aesthetization, and moving it into the field of the sensible, meaning aesthetics as that which could be sensed, as that which presents itself uh, to our senses, uh, but also onto different kind of prosthetic senses, um, such as, you know, initially videos, and you know that forensic architecture's work is relying very much on video evidence, um, but also material surfaces um, that are sensing uh, events. Uh, we're working very much in war zones uh, and investigating uh, violence by state and state agencies. And very often, the nature of contemporary war is such that it happens in physical space, in the city. The city is the stage for most conflict that we are talking about, and therefore buildings and neighborhoods are really the, the scene for it, and, and traces are, are left within the concrete or brick structure of buildings, um, but also within plants, uh, within on the earth itself, etc. So the process of uh, something Matt Fuller and I call hyperstatization is both a technical and an ethical disposition to careful reading of traces for standing together with and working together with communities that are exposed to state violence and tuning ourselves very carefully to reading traces left in physical and in the digital domain. And that kind of process of hyper aesthetization. Sorry, yeah. Sorry yes? to, you know that you're not sharing your screen at the moment, right? Of course, yeah. Sorry. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I just like to speak to you first because I know that if I show her, share screen you you know your, your attention would kind of go would be aestheticized to the images um, that are presented but i will matilda i promise uh, to share a few images so the process of hyper aesthetization is a combination between a technical attunement using contemporary sensors can using different techniques of modeling different attention to image, to trace, trace left on water, trace left in building, trace left in videos, trace left in data, and a political act because it involves gathering communities of practice that, in, that includes also and are led always by those communities that are resisting state violence, neo-colonial regimes and others. Um, I will share uh, a few images 
And I would like to actually discuss the process of um, hyperstatic, that is to say that kind of attunement, uh, deep attunement to things um, in relation to a type of evidence that is not a type of object that is not often associated uh, with trace evidence. Uh, and that is um, the air. You know, that if traces are left, and as I said, on bodies, uh, in material surfaces, trace evidence could be more easily um, read. But when, when, when the violence actually is airborne, uh, it is much more uh, complicated uh, in this way. So we're talking about traces left in air, which is a bit more, less, less directly understandable, I think, but it's a very good way to enter into the entire problematics of forensic and architecture in this way. So let's start with cement in its gaseous form. Uh, back in 2008, well before forensic architecture was established, uh, as an Israeli-born, um, British-based uh, person, I was asked by human rights groups to actually um, call people in Gaza, which was then under massive bombardment, and see how people were. And I remember one of the a quote of one of the persons that I've called, and he said, my building is turning from solid to gas. I am breathing in my home. And I understood that bomb clouds, and this is what you see, is architecture in gaseous form. And in fact, a bomb cloud includes everything that the building was, some concrete, some plaster, some bricks maybe, uh, mortar, wood, glass, cloth, things you have in the house, ink, medicine, uh, and sometimes also parts of human body that are pulverized and becoming that kind of a piece of architecture, temporary piece of architecture. It is always moving, it's always dynamic. It exists for about eight to 10 minutes. And I remember that the next time we were asked to look at uh, an Israeli attack on the besieged and occupied Gaza Strip, and that was in 2014 when such attack took place. And we were not allowed to enter into Gaza, which would be the first thing we, that we would do when investigating a case, uh, try to enter the place, um, try to be in contact with the people. Uh, we had to be on the outside, but we relied on a lot of images that we found online. And when you harvest images uh, from online sources, um, you very often, or always in fact, receive images without metadata. So we know that all those images were taken in the same day uh, during the Israeli attack on Gaza. In fact, this is August 1st, but we don't know um, when and where each one is taken. And therefore what we've done was to use those bomb clouds as physical clocks, as anchors, in fact, as metadata. When you find three images of the same bomb cloud, you know that you're at exactly the same moment. It operates like a clap in film that allows you to synchronize and the different perspectives allow you to understand roughly where you are. So we built something that we called a cloud atlas, classifying every detail, every shape, every minor, being very carefully tuned to the minor differences between each cloud, horrific cloud, clouds under which entire families are erased um, and dying. And in order to understand, because every image had some air and every piece of air within it had a cloud within it, uh, in order to be able to synchronize our material. So when you see those two photographs taken by completely different people, you can firstly see that we're talking about the same three bomb clouds. And you can see that the distance uh, between the, those two on the left and those two on the right is different. 
And based on that, you can start calculating where those images are. When you uh, locate, when you find, as, as we have, the only satellite image that show the bone cloud, you can anchor this entire sequence uh, of material time, time of cloud transformation within the digital time. And you have this kind of Rosetta Stone that allows you to read cloud shape in relation to digital time and construct, uh, in fact, a timeline simply by syncing up the sky and only after that um, looking um, at the testimonies of what happens to, uh, on the ground uh, to Palestinians under this neocolonial bombardment of uh, their area. Um, so, and this is what you see, how, how the, the cloud shapes uh, create that particular timeline. Here is a hospital and a bomb falling next to a hospital. Here you see how an architectural model, in fact, that very basic 3D model, allow you to actually locate photographs uh, in space. So the cloud shape allow us to synchronize them in time. The model allow us to locate them in space. And then we have a space time. The model becomes a navigable device that allow us to move from one bomb to the other. And in fact, with fluid dynamics specialists from one state of the cloud uh, to another. And sometimes when you tune very deeply into uh, information in the cloud, you see other things that your eye does not notice. For example, we were shocked to see those bombs split of a second before it hits the ground and kills 16 people in the Tanur neighborhood of Rafa in the southern Gaza Strip. Uh, I wish we could hold that bomb there forever, um, but we caught it on one frame. And strangely enough, you can identify it in mid-flight if you locate it within a model. So the minute you build a model, you put the image in, in that space, uh, you can measure uh, exactly the, uh, because we know where the bombs hit, we know where the, pl the plane that intersects them are, where the images is taken. You put a grid behind it. Uh, you can measure the bomb in mid-flow and go to the catalog and find out which one it is. Um, water. So the problem of cloud studies is an important issue for us. And it's actually an issue that plagued the history uh, of art. The problem of painting clouds um, uh, was, was always a problem in, in painting because clouds move faster than the hand could capture them sometimes. They have to be imagined rather than described. And also the, the whole notion of cloud study was a, a combination between artists and scientists. Uh, it's really one of the times in which art and science kind of work closely together. Um, people observe and try to classify clouds uh, in the sky. This, this, um, um, those stills are coming from a work that um, we have done in forensic architecture um, with Samane Moafi and others called cloud studies. So cloud studies is those kind of atlases. John Ruskin, um, the kind of one of the uh, most important art historians of the 19th century, uh, was trying to create all sort of grids that allow us to capture that non-object in the sky. But indeed, while the earth part of the image could be measured, the sky part uh, was always had to be imagined rather than described. Um, and that is also something that is very important in our work. Um, the notion of measurement and the impossibility of measure, um, the, the necessity for aesthetics and imagination to enter and come into dialogue with, with scientific work uh, in that way. 
This image of a fog is very unclear, but it was very important for us. And it took us a long time to produce that precise level of fog. The reason that we um, do it um, is that we needed to anchor the memories of survivors of the Grenfell Tower, that is the tower that in 2017 burnt in the center of London, 72 people burned to death in probably one of the most horrific single incident in the center of the city in, in many, many decades. Um, witnesses um, to events that are very architectural, very spatial, burn flat, movement through corridors, movement through stairwells, etc., need to uh, sometimes get in sort of an architectural aid in recollection. And the cloud or the density becomes an optical device. When you speak about cloud, you speak also about shape representing a dynamic, continuously amorphous shape. Well, at the same time, you're speaking about a condition of visibility. You're always looking out at a cloud, but there's always a way to look from inside a cloud, to be situated, to be embedded uh, within it. Uh, here are some of our- The area realms around here. And I kind of closed the door, I opened the door and I kind of stuck my head out. So, hello, hello. Nobody was like really there. And then the smoke comes into the corridor and everything. But after I closed the door, it was much more of a haze rather than I could see everything. I could see the light and everything, but it was in this section here, yeah. this corridor. So this is a small part of, of the way in which haze allow a kind of a process of, and of then recollection. I remember coming down one part. Tear gas. Um, a beautiful day, a spring day in the occupied Palestinian territories near uh, the Palestinian village of Nabi Saleh, our Palestinian-led demonstration against the settlement that is here. You can see a bit of it on the top right-hand side. Just another ordinary day in, in the West Bank, and there is a kind of benign looking cloud here, but this is tear gas. And that's the first um, time I've experienced personally tear gas, not as a, of course, many times breathing it, but as a projectile. Uh, we were running towards the soldiers and got spotted that soldiers seen us. Or there's another one, this one, to shoot. And that person shoot at me and another activist and hits her in the head. Uh, with a tear gas canister that we later identified to be, be manufactured by a company called Safariland, uh, which is um, a sort of a, a horrible sounding um, Safariland, already kind of a neo-colonial name uh, for a product um, that is, um, uh, th that is, that we later investigate, I'll, I'll come back to it uh, later. Tear gas is interesting for us as another kind of cloud uh, to map. And that I've started um, when I worked on this book called The Roundabout Revolution, mapping out the way in which roundabouts, um, and that is, you know, that roundabout is no longer a roundabout operatively, it's taxing in, in the center of Istanbul, uh, but what used to be, uh, operate as a kind of um, centripetal force that protest takes over those places in order to paralyze a city. Um, protest gathers around roundabout, the roundabout revolution. Uh, and tear gas comes as a suppressive, anti-protest, anti-democratic kind of intoxication of the air making the air unbreathable for crowds to disperse. Sometimes the dispersals of the crowd, here is Manama in Bahrain, uh, is operating through, through smoke, uh, but it's the same principle. Tahrir Square, Pearl Roundabout in Manama, 
Taksim Square and many others are part of what is the roundabout revolution. And all of them were addressed through the kind of intoxication of the air. Um, here actually in Chile, uh, Plaza de la Dignidad, I, sorry, you will pronounce it much better than me, uh, in the center of Chile also, um, part of the protest began in 2019, uh, working with Chilean activists on mapping the amount of tear gas that was actually put into uh, that space, imaging that tear gas as a form. It has an architecture. The, the cloud itself is aestheticized, meaning it senses the air, the temperature, the wind in this particular location. We can see how that anti-democratic suppression uh, luckily, in this case, it was a fabulous election results coming later, but um, coming from and empowered by that movement. But you see the, the kind of desperate attempt to suppress it by poisoning an entire uh, city. Um, when we were invited to the Whitney Biennale uh, in 2019, also, I think it was 2019, we were invited to show our work uh, on police violence. We are invited to, um, to present work about other places and we realized because activists started agitating uh, about the fact that the deputy head of the Whitney board is the manufacturer of the same tear gas canister I showed you before that I've experienced myself, the Safari Land Triple Chaser. And um, we started to undertake to use the gallery itself. So often we use courts, national and international truth commission. We just presented in a truth commission in, in Colombia, oh, a, a big collaboration with the Colombian truth commission, and many other projects here. We presented work that is um, in, in a gallery itself. But we didn't use the gallery as an alternative to the court. We used the gallery to investigate the very museum, the very institution that invited us to present. That is to say, we try to change the economy of political art from one in which you have, um, you know, art is kind of invited sometimes to be very radical as long as it's inconsequential, in order to kind of to claim a kind of a, a consequential role within it, investigate the institution itself, demand, join the activists in demanding the resignation uh, of the deputy uh, head of the board for producing those images. Here's the Tijuana border, and you see how the tear gas doesn't read international border, seeps from one uh, to country to the next because the amorphous cloud cannot surrender to the Cartesian designation of, um, of, of international borders. Uh, we realize that in order to look for those clouds, what we need to do is, uh, sorry, to look for the tear gas canister manufactured by the, by the deputy uh, chair of the Whitney board, we need to train online classifiers to look through the internet. Uh, the internet is far too big uh, for us to go and find uh, everywhere it is used, and we wanted to know where it is uh, used internationally. It's forensic architecture. So we we have you know we've started to experiment both with um, looking very carefully online at those things and actually trying to teach a computer to identify them. In order to do that, you need to show um, that use of machine learning. You need to show the system about several thousands variation of a single object, and then you send it out in the wild, and hopefully it starts picking up uh, those images and, and, and bringing to you. When you say in the wild, it's a kind of technical term to meaning it's going online uh, in different channels. But we, we couldn't find enough images to do that. So what we needed to do was to actually construct that model uh, online, uh, sorry, as, as, as a 3D model, 
And in order to do that, we needed collaboration with activists in Tijuana who were finding those for us, measuring it for us. And this is my friend Emily Jassir in Bethlehem, probably the most tear gassed art residency in the world. Um, she finds a lot of those tear gas grenades in her courtyard that this allows us to measure it and build a 3D model and use synthetic, that is, if you like fake images with all the variations on them in order to um, train the computer to find real ones. Uh, so you, you, we, we're using those as, you know, to create those several thousand uh, images of data sets. So you need to show that in all sort of permutation, half hidden, and you need to show it against different color backdrops so that the classifier knows how to uh, make distinctions between figure and ground. And then we were generating, I know it looks like, you know, we're trying to make some aesthetically pleasing images, but we were just like implanting those objects within a different kind of realistic and non-realistic background in order for the classifier to learn. Now, there's something very important to understand about our use of technology, both satellite images uh, and other in, in machine learning uh, that are technologies that are, we shouldn't be taking them simply as neutral technologies. These are technologies of their own history, usually military history in the case of satellite images. Um, other, you know, potential human rights violations are uh, performed with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So when we sometimes we when we use these technologies, we use them in order to expose violations in the real world. And we use the case in a real world in order to what we call introspect, introspect the algorithm itself to see what what it is that we could learn about machine learning processes through critical use. Um, now I'm going to show you something that anyone with photosensitivity, please avoid looking for the next couple of minutes, maybe. Um, and um, this is a part of the video that is both, you know, it was screened in the, at the Whitney and it very much looks, I guess, well, if you think, uh, like an art piece, but it's actually a data set, a training set for the algorithm to learn how to uh, identify triple chaser. This is, these are the several thousand images and we encoded them as individual frames within a video. That means that that video that you see in the previous ones, um, having two audiences in mind, they're meant for people, and they're meant for an algorithm. It has a machinic viewer and a human viewer uh, at the same time. Uh, you know, let me kind of like skip through uh, that, but effectively it's a, it's a training set encoded um, as an art uh, work within it, then you send it After we train our classifier online, on synthetic images, this is a beautiful we will deploy it to voice for of real David ones, Byron from leveraging tags and keywords. Talking Heads. We ask him to do it because burning down the, the house was The system returns a percentage was, for each image, indicating its confidence that the highlighted pixels signify a triple chaser tear gas manufactured by the Safari Land Group. Um, yes, uh, you know, the story is well known. The vice chair of the board had to resign and, um, and later actually disinvested from tear gas during the BLM protests uh, on May and June, 2020. So, you know, you, you sometimes, you know, working in galleries is not only about symbolic, you know, statements, but they can become sites uh, of accountability. I'm gonna skip some, because I want us to skip some kind of clouds. Uh, in order to finish with one, um, important story that I wanted to tell you, and that is about our work on cyber surveillance and the Israeli cyber surveillance group, the NSO group. 
Uh, and this is uh, another open source analysis that we've done. There's been a lot of research, uh, and I'm sure all of you have read about Pegasus, this sort of um, malware that was designed um, to target uh, smartphones, particularly iPhones, um, and ended up being used against civil society actors, journalists, such as these people, human rights defenders worldwide. And the story, the way the story was told was really about, you know, each particular case separately. And we wanted to see what kind of, what we can see in that sort of like cloud of data, if you like, what kind of patterns uh, could make themselves uh, distinct by, uh, by studying the relation between events, not only uh, the events itself. So we started to data mine uh, all those targets. And this, these are in blue, you see here, moments where um, people were infected on a timeline, every blue dot, and this is within one country, I think that's Mexico, uh, you see a successful or an attempted targeting of a phone. And then we wanted to interlace it with an open source analysis on what happens to the people that are targeted. So we wanna know effectively, once you are being surveyed, once your phone is under surveillance, what happens to your life? Uh, we wanted to break that notion that uh, what we're talking about is really simply um, violation of privacy and actually violence. So here you see the, the digital violence, if you like, and now it's going to be interlaced, I think, with, uh, yeah, with instances in re the red dots, uh, our investigation of exactly what happened to those people in the physical domain. So let's say if you were surveyed and somebody broke into your office after that, or at the same time, um, we could see correlation between digital and physical violence in that way. Uh, and then we correlated that with all sort of other data um, and, and did um, more analysis on that. Yes, yeah, sorry, somebody want to say something? Hello? No. Okay, so um, this is, you, you, can, you can look online at our platform where um, you could see multiple form of relation between the kind of the data point, the, the, the acts of surveillance and the act of uh, physical violence. And you can see also how it is not never just individuals that are targeted, but what is targeted with surveillance, our relation between people are actually groups of people. You know, it starts sometimes as one person and spreads to colleagues, etc. cetera. Uh, so here you have another kind of work about aggregate data, about looking at data architecturally, putting it in space time and looking not at the data point itself. Our organization is on, we don't use the technology to survey uh, each individual point, but actually um, at the somehow at the relation between them. There's something very architectural uh, we think about that, about you know the way architects think is is really looking at relation between events in space time. So I guess you know I want to leave some time for conversation. Um, so that's a kind of like a very quick sort of landscape of. Um, of work that I wanted to show, and hopefully in conversation we can do more. I can also I can keep my I can keep my PowerPoint if you like open. Well, you know what? I'll 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 stop sharing it now, and I can I can go back to it. Uh, oh, sorry, did I just share it again? Stop sharing. Yeah, and I can go back to it in question time if there's something I'd like to demonstrate. Anyway, thank you for listening. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, for your lecture.
Uh, I think it was an incredibly uh, rich lecture of contents uh, and extremely inspiring. Your work represents, uh, from my point of view, a strategic tact of social, political, uh, and economic denunciation. Uh, and it's incredible, it's incredible to see how the physical domain uh, is transformed uh, in your work in a battlefield where digital and physical elements uh, somehow take a new form, a new meaning. Uh, what I'm curious to understand uh, is a little bit the methodology behind uh, your operational activities and uh, according to which criteria uh, forensic architecture establish uh, an operative agenda, which are the, the elements uh, that trigger uh, the activation of the operation of observation, spatial observation that you are performing. Thank you. I mean, this is, uh, this is right at to the heart of our kind of like ethical political dilemma because you know there is we developed capacities to investigate police murders and we do that worldwide and we investigate capacity to do you know to to look at the weaponization of the air really from the scale of a tear gas to chemical weapon to force fires um there's a lot of of of, of work that we do on different fields and but we are very careful not to become and i don't know if we can i don't know if it's maybe it's a futile kind of desire not to become experts and i'll tell you i mean what you see is kind of like a field of expertise you go like what is this guy talking about well i'll, I'll tell you how i see that meaning if we would start doing the kind of work will develop a kind of like a, a set of tools and apply it again and again and again and again and again on the same things will become an expert in that in fact in forensic architect we never accept a commission that we know how to solve if if there's somebody coming to the office you know and and very much we are like a kind of like an architectural detective agency no we operate purely by commission we do not initiate work uh, and, and I'll tell you later why we don't do that anymore. We used to do that. We don't do that anymore. Um, we, if we know how to do it, we would train other people to do it. We would pass on the material. We would you know, make our model open source. The technologies, everything would be there and hopefully other people would do that. We want to invest enormous amount of time our intellect, our passion, our aesthetic and conceptual technological ability in using cases to develop new technologies and new ways of thinking about the relation between space and politics, data and media, etc. Uh, so this is in this sense, we are a bit different or very different than other human rights groups. We don't have a section for different parts of the world where we kind of like monitor what is going on. Um, we, we, we do not have, you know, of course, there's a lot, I, I personally have kind of developed in the context of the anti-colonial struggle in Palestine, but it's not that we are only working in Palestine, you know, we just, as I said, we just opened uh, really huge um, work with the Colombian Truth Commission in, uh, in, in Bogota, in a museum in Bogota and, and many other things. Um, so that is the case. The reason why we only work to commissions is both ethical and intellectual. So firstly, ethically, we do not want to enter into the space of trauma of other people uninvited. Um, if we would say, oh, that's an interesting case, you know, here is a police murder. We think it's interesting. Let us do it. It's kind of like we invite ourselves into the site of enormous amount of pain uh, where there are activists already on the ground that do work, uh, et cetera, uh, and lead the struggle. Uh, so we need to be invited into it. It's true that some people in the world know better and maybe better internet connect, you know, like better connected to the to the wires in which we circulate and have better chance. So, so we might, you know, through local partners say we are around, but we will not um, invite ourselves into a case. Second, as I say, you know, there are different patterns of mind that one develops if one does 
if we would follow our intuition, if we would follow, we would always get trapped within a kind of like a similar uh, type of obsessions. And we want different commissions to come. And we know that the, the mysteries of events in the world are so complex that there will always be more difficult and more complicated than what we can imagine with the poverty of our imagination sitting uh, in London or now elsewhere, because now we are a big network of organizations uh, that are located uh, in London, uh, in Palestine, in um, different parts in Paris, in different uh, parts of the world. Berlin. Maybe. Uh, thanks for your uh, answer. Just uh, a thought on, uh, on what you were saying. So what you, would you consider that uh, the point of union, uh, the point in, uh, in common between all these different work at the end somehow is uh, uh, a, a methodology that you bring, uh, a point of perspective that allow you to maybe the implementation of digital technologies to look into spatial dynamics purely, no? With the fascination of someone that is trying to decode patterns that are occurring uh, through um, a different perspective, not through different digital eyes that maybe can unveil this reality. So the fact that it's unknown also brings uh, maybe uh, the aesthetics that you are generating that is so yeah. different, but also so so in common, no, between one work and the other in terms of yeah. sensibility that's what i wanted to yeah yeah, underline. yeah. obviously there, there are common threads and obviously you see evolution of our work and if you go through our 70 investigations uh, online you would see ah okay it's similar uh, for us we see bigger differences than anyone would see from the outside between cases um and and there is a body of knowledge that evolves and i say that as a caveat to what i said before um, I guess that people imagine, though, that the work relies on really advanced technology in a way that I don't know that it relies on such advanced technology. In fact, and, and I can see it takes not a long time for, you know, I, I wouldn't say, you know, not techie graduates, but like graduates of like information design, architecture, um, you know, computing, um, film uh, schools to, be, to, to get into the work. Meaning that the technology that already exists on the laptop, what they used to do um, pretty fast sinks in with the sort of like cloud of other practitioners that kind of build together. So there's not a whole new kind of magic technology that is out there. It's pretty kind of basic use of architectural uh, animating uh, media. What, what, what does happen is the kind of sensibility of how to enter a case. And, and we know now that, you know, asking the right question. So, the, for example, the cloud thing in Gaza that I showed you. It's coming out, not out of the kind of te technology of mapping clouds, you know, I mean, there's many people probably on that call that can do it already or have done it or have done things that are much more sophisticated than what it looks here. It's understanding that this is what you need to do and syncing it up with the political relation with Palestinian groups on the ground, understanding what's the important question legally, you know, understanding how to quote unquote, package it as a legal case for the International Criminal Court or for the UN or for Truth Commission, or in fact, putting something in a gallery in a way that would be strategic intervention, no? So, so the, you know, the thought is a kind of, it's a much more cloud thinking, like uh, in, in a way that, um, that, you know, to know how, where to put energy, in a sort of political acupuncture. No, we sometimes we do individual small scale cases, but we do them because they are entry point into wider political matrix around a question. So this is really where um, the intellectual project of forensic architecture is 
where you we would say to stakeholders, to people that invite us to do, we say we'll build a kind of strategy with them. We'll go like, okay, here, this is what we'll go with to court. This is what we'll go with to the media. And that's what we'll do in art and cultural domain. And then, you know, in fact, then we'll take a step back. You would lead the, you know, the kind of like, you'd carry that evidence and make it political and, and let's think together about how to do that. So um, I guess this is really where, where the work is, is kind of like syncing up that technology that I, you know, I, of course it's advanced technology, but it's not out of the, uh, this, the scope of imagination with acute critical thinking and political thinking. Um, I think I kind of have uh, in some way, uh, thank you so much, sorry, firstly, <laughs> for the, the fantastic uh, lecture. I think in some way I have a question that um, relates also to what you were just saying now in some way, because um, I was super interested about the fact that um, you are working on one side with with data which is uh quantitative um but also with questions of design and and more in, well more focused maybe on the question of aesthetics but it which is highly qualitative no so considering that you're you're looking for a relationship between events in space and time and having this forensic approach to the architecture of these spaces um, I was interested in understanding how you handle, uh, and I say the risks, um, because maybe it's not a risk per se, but it's something that is integrated into the methodology of, for example, confirmation bias or correlation as causation. Um, so how do you, if you counterbalance that, or if you use that as experimentally, let's say, within the process of development of your projects? Yeah, thank you for this. Also a good sort of entry point for a discussion. So, um, you know, a lot of things are very important for us. For example, as I said, you know, the kind of like an anti-expertise, uh, which uh, I fully understand the paradox and I fully understand you go like, what? This is how he describes it. But, you know, it's kind of like it allows us to think through that problem critically. So, and another one is the, to say science, you know, forensics is not only about science. It's about the investigation requires aesthetization, meaning opening ourselves, making ourselves sensitive to sense more things from, you know, to hyper aestheticize a surface, whether it's a surface of a street or of a, of a building that, that has traces on it or an image. Um, and it requires presentation. Every forensic analyst knows that they must say that aesthetics has got nothing to do in foren with forensics and, and actually are aware of how the performance, the quality of the presentation contributes to conviction. And I mean conviction in double sense of the word to convince you and to convict you or sorry, not you until but like somebody else. So aesthetics and science are intertwined now that gives a lot of ammunitions to our detractors. When we present in art spaces, our reviewers say, well, this is evidence. This is not art. What are you doing here contaminating our art, which is a space only for imagination, speculation, et cetera, uh, with your kind of empirical science? When we go to the court, they say, why are you bringing art here, contaminating our holy of holy, the court, as a site where only objective facts are allowed inside. But we like what we call dirty evidence. We like, because we need it, we like it because we undertake our cases in such a way that they have two aims, both to you know, support a particular recognition, act of verification, and to open the possibility for those things to be seen and heard to those things to enter into domain of the political sensible, of political aesthetics, if you like. So um, in a sense, we pay 
prices for it. Sometimes we get thrown out of court uh, for our activism. You know, so I, you know, whenever I am myself, um, you know, all my sins, which are long and online, are being read out to me, or every petition and every time I supported BDS and and, and signed for this or that. They said, oh, you see, he's political. We cannot trust what, what, uh, what this person is saying. Um, but we think those acts of entanglement are very important and very strategic because we need a voice. We need to empower ourselves as architects, as aesthetic practitioners, as artists, as filmmakers to intervene within the field of politics, not through, you know, neglecting and throwing out what we know but as what we as who we are with our set of talents with our imagination with our creativity with our aesthetics enter and ask for a voice for it super thank you um we have a couple of questions in the chat and um, maybe we start off with one from melissa who was interested in, in hearing um, if we start from the idea that violent events are frequently seen from a single perspective, which can be political, media, disciplinary, personal, et cetera, what is forensic architecture's contribution to the construction of a multifaceted narrative or perspective? Yeah, so polyperspectivity is, is one of the central um, it's one of the central principles that we're working with. Of course, I, you know, Melissa, I can I can read through your question that um, maybe an echo, maybe it's not what you mean. And and, and if, even if you do, I'm, I'm just fascinated by that of a kind of, you know, there's not one truth, there are multiple truths uh, around. Um, we, we don't fully kind of, believe in, in multiple realities in which multiple truth exists, but we completely understand a situated experience, a different situated experience of the same event, meaning that the same event would mean different things to different people, would be seen and felt and approached in different perspectives. And we think that our models are bringing in those perspectives together. So effectively kind of like you've seen it in a first project. You have an architectural model or an urban model. You put inside of it anything between four and 7,000 cones of vision of cameras within that. What you do is you have a polyperspectival <coughs> assemblage <coughs> of X number of perspectives. Sometimes they are resolved, sometimes not. In fact, you know, talking about deep fake and all those things, when you have a lot of perspectives and the majority of them are faithful and truthful, a fake video would drop out, would drop out of the mix. For us, we don't believe in truth, we believe in verification. So instead of veritas or verite or verdad, I guess it's in Spanish, uh, we like the word verification, which is an imminent practice. It's not a noun, it's a verb. Uh, because it's continuously shifting and continuously adjusting to multiple other perspectives that come in. And every perspective that is added shifts the fabric, the evidentiary fabric, uh, a little bit. But uh, that fabric is a common. It's as much of a common like a lake or like the sea or the sky. We need to protect that common reality as a metapolitical condition. Uh, on which we struggle. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Yel, for uh, for your time. Uh, we know that uh, you, you told us that, you, know, you were going to be available only for uh, one hour. I, I'm okay to take another. I, I see the question. I don't want to leave. Ah, there is another oh. one from yeah. uh, from Michael. Uh, if you if you have time to also to reply to this one, it will be great. Yeah. So Michael is asking. Yeah, maybe. Um, one question with two questions, because the question sure. from is very similar to the one that I asked. Michael was interested. Sorry, Aldo, I interrupted you. No, no, um, go, go, go ahead. Michael was interested in understanding um, whether you you sought out initially the when you started your this type of work or the forensic architecture approach, whether you sought it out 
um, initially or did it present itself to you in some way? And we also have Alison uh, who was asking a little bit about, I guess, what or how or do you imagine that the work that you do at Forensic Architecture can then become the basis, for example, for a design studio to design? So she's giving a very uh, specific example of um, if we can use data, put it in time and space from in multiple from multiple events to deploy disaster sh shelters, for example. So if you want to touch on those two and then. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so for Michael's question first. Um, Yes, we fell upon it, or I fell upon it. I, I, you know, I started as a young graduate, or even when I was a student, doing mapping of uh, settlements uh, and other kind of physical structures uh, that were employed by Israel in the occupied territories, mainly in Gaza and the West Bank, but not only, also in in other parts. So it's kind of like using my architectural skills to understand violation of human rights performed by architects. But I was drawing maps, 3D models in kind of analyzing the architecture of Israel's occupation. I've written a couple of books on this. Um, then I kind of, I've seen that one of the things I've done, the map uh, has become an evidence in court. And I go like, well, that was, I can see that architectural critique is not needing to be confined for a book that I would, I don't know, like write and then send you know, would be read by other students and colleagues within the architectural community. But I was very happy to put my work in the most violent and antagonistic of forums. And that is either the sort of like the political public domain or court systems, etc. Uh, so, but I still thought of architecture, of architectural evidence as evidence of buildings. And I thought about it as construction and destruction. So I was looking at the way in which buildings would collapse and destroyed and try to look at them like an archaeologist looking at um, an ancient ruin. I was looking at the, the ruins of today, uh, like in a, what the, Gilles Deleuze called an archaeologist of the present. So, and then started the social media revolution, if you like, then, you know, Google Earth uh, made available satellite images and cartography turned into photography. And then we chanced upon another technique, which is that architectural models is the only way to make sense of multiplicity of videos. Because what it, when you investigate videos that do not show the whole incident, and most videos do not show a whole incident and can go viral, they're fragments, you need to assemble them together in space time and the model can do that. And that was boom. We understood at the beginning of the social media revolution, we have an optics. Architecture is like the optics that you put on you in order to, it's the only way to understand multiplicity of videos in space time. So that was great. And on that, we built on and on and on, um, you know, further works that indeed, and I take it, you know, may look, you know, similar to you, but for us, <laughs> you know, the kind of, you know, the, the sort of uh, minor, minor differences are, are major. Um, and then there was a question by Alison uh, about turning these analytics into design. Uh, it would be very interesting to see what you could do with that work. And I'll be very, if you, if you do manage to, to do that, I'll be, uh, uh, I'd love that. Um, I get this question a lot in architectural schools um, because I think also, and, and this is by no way critique, uh, also, I, I'm, I'm just, in, because I, I find in your question a lot, you know, it's very genuine and supportive, et cetera. But sometimes in architectural schools, analysis, we, we're so trained to think of analysis as a stage towards design, no? Like a studio is design, is divided into like analysis stage, and then synthesis and proposal. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, for me, I'm quite content to cut that thread, you know, between analysis it, and they, we don't need the design to validate our analysis. And I know you didn't ask that, uh, but still maybe now after 10 years of, of kind of showing how analysis could operate in the world, how analysis could shift political realities, 
uh, in the world, how analysis could convict people, stop things. And, you know, not always a lot of, you know, in the human rights world, you know, you always operate on failures, but uh, some, some effect. Um, maybe it's time to actually take your question seriously and see how, what is the space that could evade capture by surveillance, how counter surveillance and counter forensics can operate as a technique of evading the power of visual surveillance. I mean, th this is the kind of questions I, I, I would ask myself, not so much, you know, how to fortify a place, but how to think about space in relation to media and understanding that the media that we use, social media, sometimes, sometimes not always, benign, uh, but the targeting media, uh, the media of battlefield, very much the cameras on drones and, and heads of missiles and on all sort of things flying on the ground could be extremely oppressive. So my starting point to your question, Alison, would be to think about a certain relation between space and image and how space could actually be transformed in order to evade media capture in some way, or not evade, but be in some kind of relation between space and image. And I think that that relation between space and image is at the heart of what we as architects need to think about now anyway. Thanks a lot for uh, your answer. Uh, in relation also to maybe space and media, uh, could be interesting for uh, for the students that are uh, listening to read the book of uh, Laura Kurgan, Close Up at a Distance. Uh, yes, it's also an amazing book to to speak about this new source of information that let us understand the ter ter territory from a different perspective. Uh, and uh, I think this is a, a contribution uh, that is in line maybe with the work of forensic architecture, uh, offering perspectives or points of observation no, that can provide us another understanding of our territories. Um, so with that, I would like to, to close this lecture uh, from the Master in Robotics and Advanced Construction and the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. We want to thank you for uh, your amazing lecture. Yeah. Uh, it was worth <laughs> the, the wait. Uh, I mean, uh, really thanks a lot. Uh, for uh, for taking your time and sharing with us this uh, inspirational lecture, and I look forward to meet you in person, hopefully soon here in Barcelona. Uh, yes, very uh, much. Your agenda also allow us. Thank you, Aldo. Very much so. Yes, um, I hope to when when I'm next in Barcelona, I hope to to drop by. Are you, are you in town? Or... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I'm here in Barcelona, and uh, for sure you would receive an invitation from our side. Uh, so be ready. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to meet you here. Uh, so again, okay, guys, thank you for listening in. And thank you for those that asked questions. It was very interesting for me too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.